in today. The question and answer session will immediately follow the presentation. If you have a question for our speaker, please type it into the questions box in your GoToWebinar panel on the right side of your screen. Today's webinar is sponsored by Wellbe's Guided Care Path. A guided care path helps create a single, streamlined patient experience through the entire journey of a total joint replacement. By creating a continuum of connections between patients, their families, and their providers. Smart checklists are delivered just in time as patients progress through their surgery plans and recovery. The information is always there for reference when needed in case preparation or follow-up instructions are forgotten. This helps reduce patient anxiety and improves outcomes. To request a free demonstration, visit us at wellbe.me. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Sandy Metrar has specialized in orthopedics for 30 years. She is the Neurosurgery and Orthopedic Service Line Coordinator for Butler Health System, providing oversight of the business aspects of neurosurgery and orthopedics while continuing to first assist in the operating room and provide patient care at the bedside. Sandy, I'm going to change it over to you and you can take it away. Thanks, Megan. Let me just bring up my screen here. Um, so welcome, everybody. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is we'd like to have a little bit of a, some more information about yourself and what you bring to the table and what, um, uh, what, where you're coming from um, in this uh, new concept of service line management. Um, to give you a little bit of information, this picture that you see is of Pittsburgh. Uh, Butler Health System is north of Pittsburgh, about 35 miles or so. Um, and if you've paid any attention to uh, the current climate of medicine in Pittsburgh, we have UPMC, which is a huge conglomerate that extends uh, from the um, lower boundary of Pennsylvania all the way up to the northern boundary at Erie. Um, UPMC is currently in a little bit of a spat with um, the Highmark uh, system, and they are developing a different uh, competitive uh, hospital system. Um, Butler Health System remains independent um, and competitive. Our uh, general population, uh, we have a small town um, or a small city uh, surrounded by rural areas. And our biggest concern, of course, is to prevent out-migration uh, to Pittsburgh for medical care. So this is the type of climate that we are existing in. Um, and uh, part of that competitive um, issue is uh, how to streamline our health system um, and provide superior care closer to home. I started as a, the orthopedic service line coordinator about five years ago. Um, this was developed um, uh, as a vision between uh, one of our surgeons and uh, the VP of patient care at the time. Um, and so I think the first thing to do is when you are looking to create a service line is what is your hospital vision statement? Um, ours, we exist to make a positive dis difference in lives of our patients by providing compassionate, high-quality care and comfort in inspiring health and well-being. If we use this as our basis for our decision-making and moving forward um, in our patient care decisions, uh, we find uh, that it, this a vision statement usually and all, well, always provides us with the correct direction for where we want to go. So the first thing in developing a service line is you have to have administration and surgeon support. Um, having consensus uh, between administration and surgeons is the key. Um, as I said, we had one surgeon uh, who had the vision um, and one uh, vice president who also had the vision um, and decided to come together to improve patient care, improve hospital uh, profitability, and create a win-win for uh, situation for both. 
So what do you need in a surgeon champion? Well, the traits that you want to look for are you need somebody who is energetic uh, and willing to put in the time and energy, uh, motivated to increase volume and improve efficiency, needs to be a team player both with administrations and staff, is interested in controlling hospital costs, and supported by other orthopedic surgeons uh, to represent their interests. Um, at the time we started our service line, we had two independent orthopedic practices in the city, in the town. Um, uh, so we had to be sure that we represented both equally. Our administration champion traits that we want are somebody that's able to understand the surgeon's perspective, is willing to work creatively to overcome obstacles, willing to invest the time, money, and personnel required to develop a service line, um, but our administration also expects to see return on investment through increased volume and decreased cost. What are the conflicts? Well, surgeons have difficulty with what I like to call organizational noise. There is a clash between the goals and demands. In other words, we have value-based care, and we also have revenue. These tend to compete with one another uh, for the surgeon uh, to provide what he feels is ideal care for his patients, but stay within revenue boundaries. Surgeons are under increasing pressure where they feel they're personally responsible to fix all of the problems that they encounter during a day. Uh, but they don't have a time to run a busy practice, provide patient care, operate in the operating room, and still invest the amount of administrative time uh, to work on these issues independently. Um, they also don't understand what we call business time. In other words, in medicine, usually we're presented with a problem, uh, we make a decision, and we move forward very quickly uh, to fix that problem, whether it's a patient health care issue, an operation, test results. We find that we want those immediately or very quickly and are able to do that. But when it comes to business time, uh, there are usually months to solve problems. Um, those problems have to be evaluated, a plan put in place, and this tends to be very frustrating for surgeons. Administrators have difficulty seeing past the costs that are required to initiate a service line. You have to hire personnel, pay them salary and benefits. Um, they're um, always working with an ever increase, uh, ever shrinking budget, um, and find that additional costs are hard to swallow. It's hard for them to see into the future and say, if I invest this money now um, in this uh, service line, I will be able to see uh, cost savings into the future. And they're also trusting that the surgeon, uh, with this increased uh, efficiency, will be able to increase his volume and therefore increase revenue for the hospital to cover the cost of covering uh, the cost of servicing a um, program like an orthopedic service line. What are the elements? Well, you have to have a program vision. You have to determine that you have a need. Um, you need a surgeon champion that fits the traits that I was talking about, an administration champion that's willing to work with the surgeon and work with the team. You need a program director, and then you need an oper what I call the R orthopedics operational team uh, to institute those changes. So who is your orthopedic service line director? And by the way, I think that this uh, can be used for any sort of subspecialty in a hospital that you'd like to direct it to. As Meg mentioned, um, I am also now the neurosurgery uh, service line coordinator. Um, we started a neurosurgery service line uh, in January 
and we did not have any neurosurgery here prior to that, uh, interventional and surgical craniotomies, um, and we had it up and running uh, with an operation team, an operations management team, within four months. We were operating and fully uh, functional. Um, so I think that this can also be used for any other subspecialty that maybe your hospital is looking at um, developing. Anyway, the, the orthopedic service line director is a non-surgeon, and I think their backgrounds can vary. I have met uh, service line directors that have a business background, nursing background. I'm a physician assistant, um, and I think that each one brings strong points to the table and a perspective um, um, that's valuable. And the favorable traits are good organizational skills, good communication skills, the ability to facilitate the alignment of goals between the surgeon and administration, analytical skills, um, able to pay attention to details, but also the ability to see the larger picture and the direction that the hospital uh, wants to go in. One of the biggest problems I've uh, seen, uh, I was in private practice for 24 years, was never a hospital employee, and then came over to work at a hospital. So the, the whole hospital culture uh, was a little bit of a shock to me. Uh, but one of the things that uh, was glaringly obvious to me in the very beginning was that information in hospitals is siloed. Um, each department uh, doesn't necessarily communicate with the other departments uh, regularly. Um, and oftentimes, we're working on the same projects individually uh, with no knowledge that somebody else uh, is working on the same thing. And maybe that getting together would facilitate both of their success. So by taking down the silos, you need to have the right people at the table at the, at the same time. Um, what solves an issue for one can increase issues for another. Um, so maybe um, your pre-admissions department or the physician's office said, well, I can solve this problem by changing this process. Um, only to discover that maybe uh, case management or the nursing floor now has increased work uh, because they've changed something unilaterally. One of my favorite uh, little terminologies is the hospital salute. And anybody who's worked in a hospital um, has seen this, where uh, everybody points in the other direction. Well, that's that department's problem. That isn't my problem. If they hadn't done this, then this wouldn't have happened. And you need to stop the hospital salute. And the fastest and easiest way to do that is to have all of the players at the table at the same time. So who do you want on your team? It's also interesting, when I first came uh, to the hospital as an employee, <clears throat> there was no uh, reference, uh, nowhere for me to go to really figure out how to organize um, a service line. Uh, and my vice president said, well, nice to have you on board. Decide who you want to have on your team and let them know that they're participating. Um, I wasn't even familiar with any of the key players. Uh, so uh, I had my physician advocate. I had my vice president uh, advocate. And I was the service line director. So the other key players I needed to get on the team on a regular basis was nursing, um, our floor manager, uh, the person on our orthopedic floor who was able to institute and monitor uh, changes. Um, in our operating room, we have an orthopedic team leader. Um, she regularly attends our meetings. Um, and as needed, the operating room director or supervisor, uh, depending on the type of issue we're discussing. Um, we have physical therapy. We have our director of physical therapy, a pre-admissions representative, and then case management and social services. These are my core team members who sit at the table with me every month uh, to review 
uh, what we're, where we're headed, and the status of our um, current issues that we're working on. And then I have our ad hoc team members. These are people that are invited to the table depending on what issues we're working on and what needs to be addressed. Anesthesia, obviously uh, extremely important when we're talking about operating room efficiencies, uh, caseload, uh, case order. Sterile processing um, for case turnover, accessibility to equipment that we need. Pharmacy, billing and coding. Uh, the billing and coding is key if you're discussing uh, complications, um, how you're being reported out in health grades, for example. Outpatient rehabilitation, home health, and then sometimes as needed, the physician office staff. So how do you get started? Well, first of all, you need to listen to all of the team members. And I started with individual interviews. Uh, sat each one down in their office or mine um, to talk candidly one-on-one -on -one about what they felt the issues were and how they needed to be addressed. Now, where this became a problem for me is, unfortunately, my administration did not announce uh, my position or my arrival. Um, so many of these people didn't have a clue as to who I was and why I was getting involved. Um, so it's important that your um, administration advocate uh, announces that you are starting a service line and that uh, your orthopedic service line director is uh, the lead person for that. The other question I always ask was, how did they think that the problem should be solved? Um, this is also key because you get insight uh, for each person and what they bring to the table. The next step was I had to go and investigate it, and I really needed to see whether the problems that were being uh, reported to me were actually problems in reality. Some of them weren't, or some of them weren't as big a problem as maybe some people thought they were. So it was important for me to go and observe the problems in each department um, to see what the strengths and weaknesses were and what I could do or what our team could do to change those problems. Always the question is, uh, what will show the fastest success over the most areas, which comes to the uh, well overused term of pick hang, low hanging fruit, but I think that it um, it serves well in this situation. What were some of the issues that were identified? Well, variability in surgeons' care pathways. Um, if uh, we look only at our total joint replacement program, I had four total joint surgeons who every single one of them did things differently. Uh, this was very confusing uh, for pre-admissions testing, uh, case management, social services, and certainly the nurses on the floor in, in determining how they were supposed to care for each of these patients. Inconsistent and late OR start times. Although people always say that they would like to uh, catch up over time, Lost time in the OR is never regained. Um, with late start times and inconsistent start times, um, this, of course, uh, will affect your um, volumes um, over the year. Slower than ideal OR turnover time, this again, will affect your volumes. If um, you have inconsistent start times and slower than ideal OR turnover times, it's hard for a surgeon to increase their daily case volume. There was no uniform uh, or unified total joint patient education. We had an increased length of stay. Uh, the finger was pointed at poor discharge planning. We had inconsistent patient expectations. I think this had a lot to do with our inconsistent education. Um, each patient um, surgeon or the surgeon's office uh, gave them differing information. Uh, this took time um, 
in the hospital uh, once the patient was admitted. Um, they had different expectations as to when they were going to be discharged, how they were going to be discharged, and what was expected of them to be responsible for after discharge. We also had high variable costs. So where do you start? Well, the easiest thing to do is find and work to fix the most common problem. So some of the things that we identified was to start with the small projects. We streamlined order sets, progress notes, patient education, and pre-op testing. Um, the progress note um, issue was very simple to uh, uh, fix. We have um, computerized systems, of course, to access all of our patients' laboratory tests, vital signs, et cetera. And what we were hearing uh, from the nurses on the floor and certainly from the uh, surgeons and rounding physician assistants was it took them forever to get all of the information um, out of the computer. So one of the very simplest things that we did was I created a uniform progress note with certain data that would be printed out so that they could arrive on the floor or the unit clerk could print the progress notes for their inpatients um, and have them ready when they arrived on the floor so that there was a significant amount of regular information, physical therapy notes, et cetera, that they did not have to go in individually and look up for each patient. Um, early success will spark team interest. So by simply changing the progress notes and making the lives of our, our rounding surgeons and PAs, um, the nurses on the floor, by changing those progress notes to make rounds in the morning more efficient, um, immediately started to have people say, hey, maybe this is something that's pretty good. Maybe there are, there are things that we can change pretty easily and quickly that will streamline our lives and make our patient care better. Um, assign action items with clear deadlines and accountability. Uh, I found that uh, before I fully understood the need for that, that I would um, ask people for information uh, or request certain action items of, of my team members, and maybe they just didn't quite get around to it as quickly as I thought they would. Um, by establishing clear deadlines, uh, then everybody uh, knows what's expected of them. Engage and empower your frontline people. It's amazing the amount of information that a nursing aide on the floor could have or the scrub tech in the OR. They contain huge amounts of information about your day-to-day -day operations and nobody really ever asks them their opinion. Even your central sterile people, they're in the basement, nobody ever thinks about them. They have a wealth of information that can help you to streamline your processes. When you first start your operations team meetings, I would suggest every two weeks until everybody is on the same page, and then you can increase them to once a month. I would never go less than once a month because, again, it keeps people on the right path and it holds them accountable for the action items that you want them to address. One of our first team projects was what we call Total Joint Camp. The best thing about Total Joint Camp is, first of all, Total Joint Replacement patients go through the entire spectrum. So they start in the physician's office. They will go through your pre-admissions testing office. They go through your pre-op, the operating room, to the floor. They encounter every department um, that is on your operations team. I found that by starting with my total joint program, other programs, um, subspecialties in orthopedics, tend to fall in line um, just by working on that one thing. So by working on um, uh, total joints, I found that working with my sports medicine doctors, my hand specialists, 
et cetera, spine, those all tend to become easier because of streamlining the processes. We streamlined patient education, um, and as we took a deep look at it, we found that we were repeating work that didn't need to be repeated. Um, our patient education with starting a total joint camp or a joint class delivered the same information across both orthopedic practices in a consistent manner. We found that the preoperative uh, testing was performing nursing assessments only to discover that when they uh, arrived in pre-op holding, the nurses were repeating those nursing assessments. Again, this is redundant work. We improved our patient expectations. They were receiving a consistent message from every direction, and everybody understood what that message was. So their length of stay, um, what was expected of them when they were in the hospital, what they could expect to hear from anesthesia. We started them on prehab or preoperative um, exercises. This decreased their um, length of time to receive instruction on exercises when they were an inpatient. Um, and over the course of a year, we reduced our length of stay by 1.5 days, which is significant. This cost savings alone uh, can justify um, the staff uh, hiring um, an orthopedic uh, service line director. And overall, it unified our operations team. As people saw that this was a good thing, uh, they were happier. They were working smarter, not harder, and um, were happy uh, to participate in future projects. Later process improvement projects that we worked on, operating room efficiency, we streamlined our OR trays. By streamlining OR trays, we were able to decrease our sterilization costs. Um, we improved our on-time start. We paid close attention to case order. Um, this required um, uh, significant input from anesthesia. Um, our length of stay management and discharge planning. We began discharge planning prior to admission, and this also improved our length of stay. Patient satisfaction improved because they were receiving a consistent message and understood what the plan was and what was going to happen to them next. Variable cost control is always complicated. Uh, some of the things could be uh, cap pricing for uh, your uh, joint implants or uh, sports medicine implants. Uh, sometimes it's as simple as looking at what type of uh, prep products your surgeons use. Um, but it's a, it's a great place, again, to justify the cost of a service line. We are always looking for further improvements, and one of the things that I am certainly um, understanding after doing this for five years is you will always have to revisit prior issues to keep them on track. They will need tweaking in the future, um, and so you can't get discouraged when things tend to uh, run off the road a little bit, um, and, but it usually doesn't take a whole lot to realign them. So how can you create a dedicated team? Well, you need to be the solution and not the problem. Your team needs to want to work with you. Um, some of the things that I did uh, was to be not only on time but early and to offer help. If my initiative at the time was that I wanted my cases to start on time, um, then I was in the pre-op area making sure that things were expedited and that the patients uh, were going down the hallway to the operating room at the time I thought they needed to be traveling down there. 
Uh, sometimes it's just as simple as uh, pitching in and getting some of that work done. Um, OR efficiencies and turnover times. Um, had a fun time for a while where uh, one of our housekeepers who mopped the floor wasn't the fastest guy in the world. And we went through a little while where I would race him to the mop. But I wasn't um, opposed or unwilling to pick up a mop and get the floor mopped or the room turned over, uh, push the dirty instruments down the hallway um, to get the room turned over in time. When your uh, staff see you doing things like this, they tend to pick up their game a little bit um, or are more willing uh, to participate. Sometimes asking those people also, again, how, to, uh, how do they need help or how do they feel that the issue should be resolved, uh, sometimes will point the direction. But you have to be willing to roll up your sleeves and get dirty in the process. What are some of the pearls and pitfalls? Again, you need to be open to feedback. And I can't count the number of times when I started the service line that I would have someone, uh, my phone would ring, it would be somebody in the hospital, and they'd say, oh, you're in your office. And I'd say, yes, and they'd say, I'm on my way down. Um, they wanted to talk to me, um, maybe give me some criticism about some of the changes I was making. Maybe they were a little painful to them, uh, but there was a way to listen to their criticism, take that criticism, and turn it into a positive action to continue to improve and go down the road in the direction I felt we needed to travel in. Turning things into positive action sometimes requires the the help and assistance of your vice president advocate. Uh, sometimes they need to make the phone call uh, to make uh, data processing uh, get you the information that you need. And sometimes you need someone a little higher up on the ladder that's willing uh, to step in and give that help where it's needed. Small initial success will help to gain momentum. So if you can show people that they have improvements um, in their times and efficiencies. And they, you prove to them that you can show success. Uh, they tend to be more interested and they tend to work a little harder and the momentum starts to gain. Hospital culture is difficult and resistance is everywhere. It's around every corner. It took a long time uh, to get the concept of a service line in um, in mainstream. Um, it probably took me a year to get everybody to buy in the way I wanted them to. I think as service lines become more popular across the country, hopefully the resistance will be less and the changing culture, uh, hopefully that time will reduce also. What about team building? Team building is critical. Um, I can't stress to you enough that this is not something that's done in a vacuum, that you need to have everyone engaged in your processes from um, the simplest person, like the housekeeper, all the way up to the vice president, and that the team building is critical. You need to consider both rewards and recognition. Sometimes what the housekeeper wants to hear is that they've done an exceptionally good job today, or the nursing aide. And once you give them that recognition, it's amazing how much harder they will work for you on a daily basis just by being recognized for the work that they do. So give credit where credit is due. Invite them to the table. Ask them their opinion. And take them up on some of their ideas. Small things have a big impact. I can't explain to you how much success we've had here by doing silly things like pizza or milkshakes. If we have an exceptionally busy OR day, one of the things we do is we take bets, maybe with anesthesia. Um, anesthesia buys milkshakes if they're not ready before we are in the OR. And if the surgeon isn't ready before anesthesia is, then the surgeon has to buy milkshakes for the team. 
sending pizza or buying pizza for the the folks, uh, the staff in Central Sterile, um, again, goes a long way to making sure that they are happy to turn over your instruments and happy to participate. They understand that they're part of a bigger team. We do social activities here, not regularly, but, but they certainly aren't unheard of. So every year we celebrate Orthopedic Nurses Day. I hope that you do too. Um, it's a great way for your surgeons to thank the nurses on the floor or the nurses in the operating room. We get them a catered lunch. We buy them a uh, cake. We put up banners. And we explain to them that we find that their work is invaluable to our success. Our orthopedic team has a Christmas party. It's nice to get together once a year. We sing karaoke. They get a kick out of that. Nothing like watching your surgeons sing karaoke or your vice president. Um, we are currently planning a um, uh, group to go uh, to downtown Pittsburgh to watch the play Wicked. Um, everybody's putting in their money or replying. And so we'll have a large uh, group that works in orthopedics here at our hospital that will be enjoying uh, a nice afternoon watching Wicked. And a couple of years ago, we did the same thing. We had a Kenny Chesney concert here in Pittsburgh. Um, and there was probably 15 or 20 uh, that went to the concert together. This is a great opportunity for people to uh, see you outside of the workplace. It humanizes the group. And it makes people more willing to work together um, in the hospital. So in conclusion, um, the big action items are prov to provide supportive team leadership. And this comes from the top down. You need to have a supportive vice president. You need to have a supportive uh, surgeon. You need to engage and empower your frontline people. As I said, these people have a wealth of knowledge. And it's amazing how they can improve your efficiencies improve your variable costs if they understand and can participate in making that impact for the organization. You need to show profitability. Um, that's important for the hospital. It continues to be more and more imp important. And it justifies the, the value of a service line uh, program. You need to listen. And you need to praise and thank. A simple uh, job well done, a thank you at the end of the day from anybody uh, in the hospital to anyone else, whether it's on this team or another team, again, will allow for um, buy-in, motivation, and also job happiness. And that's the end of my presentation for today. Thank you, Sandy, for that informative presentation. We will now open it up for questions. If you have a question for Sandy, please type it into the GoToWebinar questions panel on the right side of your screen. While attendees are submitting questions, I want to remind everyone that today's webinar is sponsored by WellBe's Guided Care Path. Sandy at Butler uses a guided care path to help create a single streamlined patient experience through the entire journey of a total shoulder replacement by creating a continuum of connection between patients, their families, and their providers. Smart checklists are delivered just in time as the patients progress through their care plans. The information is always there for reference when needed in case preparation or follow-up instructions are forgotten. This helps reduce patient anxiety and improves outcomes. Request a free copy of an upcoming case study we'll be publishing with Sandy and Butler. Uh, respond to the poll on your screen if you would like a free copy of that. All right. <clears throat> Our first question for you, Sandy, is what's your orthopedic volume there at Butler? Somebody was wondering. Our orthopedic volume, uh, we do about 500 total joints a year. We currently have two total joint surgeons. Um, 
So between them, they're doing about 500 total joints a year. Um, we have a, uh, a nice spine program. Um, we're probably doing about uh, 300 spine, about the same number in um, um, sports medicine cases. Uh, we have two hand specialists. So we have a very busy orthopedic uh, program here. Uh, we have orthopedic surgeons that are um, in our OR, um, actually usually two, um, every uh, day of the week, um, and probably take up four out of our 13 um, operating rooms on a daily basis with full caseloads. Uh, our next question asks, do you utilize an orthopedic navigator as a connection point between physicians and patients? We are not using an orthopedic navigator currently. Um, we um, have uh, one of our orthopedic practices left. Uh, we are down to one orthopedic practice. Um, so uh, not currently. Has it been discussed? Yes. Um, has the um, guided patient program, at least for our inpatients, our total joints, uh, been uh, significantly helpful, yes. Um, but I don't know. Uh, one of the things that we're talking about for the future may be a preoperative optimization clinic uh, staffed with um, uh, physicians or CRNPs that can uh, perform medical clearance. These are all things that are out there um, being discussed, but not currently. Our next question asks, what role do you as the service line director have in the pre-admission process between your facility and the physician offices? Well, that whole pre-operative process was pretty much set up by me. Um, so I uh, took care of writing all of the, uh, the pre-operative um, education. Um, overhauled our surgical scheduling system to streamline that for our office, uh, our orthopedics office, and our pre-admissions testing. And up until not too long ago, I was one of the instructors in our uh, um, preoperative total joint class, our joint camp. I was over there every Wednesday and Friday providing education. Um, I've since uh, step back from that because I'm managing the neurosurgery service line also. Do you as a director have control of budget, staffing, and other P&L? No, I personally do not. Um, I know of other um, service line directors that do. Um, in my hospital, each department has their own budgets. Um, so my budget comes a little out of here and a little out of there, depending on what the needs are. And so that I would point to our operations team, since they're all sitting at the table. Um, we discuss, their, for example, uh, what budget certain things will come out of if needed. Uh, do you flip-flop OR rooms to facilitate faster turnover? Uh, that's an interesting question, and the answer is the answer is even more interesting, which is well, yes, and no. Um, we have, if we want to look just at total joints, we have one total joint surgeon who only wants to work in one room. Um, he does not um, flip flop, as you say. He doesn't swing between two rooms. And then I have another surgeon that does swing between two rooms. Our others um, are hand. Um, specialists, they get two rooms, and our sports medicine uh, guys get two rooms on certain days of the month, so it's not every, every single um, OR day that they have, but they have certain days that they swing rooms. Um, I think it, it depends on the surgeon. I think it depends on their volume and how fast they want to work. Um, our uh, swing room concept for those who want to utilize it uh, works out beautifully. Our um, one patient is prepped and draped before the other one, um, or by the time the surgeon leaves the first room, our second room patient is already prepped and draped. So they can move pretty efficiently. Um, I think our orthopedic surgeon who worked yesterday 
um, did uh, 10 cases. Nine of those were joint replacement cases, and he was finished by 4 p.m. Okay. Got a lot of great questions here. Um, if we don't get to all of them, I will certainly connect the question askers with Sandy so she can uh, maybe reply by email. But our next question is, did you have a sister hospital to help create a program without reinventing the wheel? How do you connect with a facility who is willing to share their program Oh, I no, I do not have a sister facility. I really didn't have a lot of help or assistance in starting the um, service line. Like I said, it was um, it was the vision of the VP and the um, uh, surgeon at the time. Um, so I didn't. It's really nice to have things like this where people now have guidance. It was more of me sitting and staring at a wall and trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. Um, I think I had been doing this for about a year and a half before I went to a conference, and I was very relieved to find that a lot of the stuff that I was working on um, was were things that they suggested. On the other hand, um, um, I don't have any business background. I'm a pure medical background. So some of my struggles and some of the things that I needed help with uh, were uh, from my vice president, uh, who obviously uh, had a business background. And so he could help to walk me through some of the, the, the data analysis, the return on investment, contribution margins, net revenues, and all the other things that I had. No, that was a completely different language for me. I picked it up quickly, but there was a learning curve there. So you do need to have, you need to have a nice balance between medicine and business and they have to be able to share their knowledge, um, whether that's with a sister hospital or not. But no, I am not part of a health system that has a sister hospital and that shares with me. All right. Our next question is, are you recognized as a center of excellence through Joint Commissioner Blue Cross? Thank you. Um, no, we aren't. Um, we have investigated that. And it's a little deeper than, than this webinar will go. But uh, for um, reasons, um, we decided that we did not pursue that. Great. Do you have a floor only dedicated to orthopedics? Only? We have a floor dedicated to orthopedics. Um, all of our orthopedics patients do go to one floor. Um, that floor is. Um, also shared with some other surgical patients. Uh, but as far as we are concerned, um, all of our patients go to one single floor. Right. The next question asks, how many vendors for implants do you use? Well, um, when we had four total, if you're talking only total joint replacement, at the time I came here, we had four vendors and four surgeons. We now have two vendors two surgeons. Um, we do not restrict what vendors they use. Uh, we do not tell them what implants they use. Um, but on the other hand, I can say that our surgeons have aligned with us when it comes to implant uh, prices and negotiations. Um, our surgeons are not aligned with their uh, companies. They are aligned with a hospital um, and support our endeavors. Did you use a co-management agreement to engage physicians for your ortho and neurosurgeons? A co-management, what was that, a co-management? Agreement? No, we do not have a co-management agreement. You mentioned that you streamlined the OR schedule. Were you given control to make that change, or was that driven by your OR director? It was driven by all of us as a team. So our schedule, our schedule um, input comes from anesthesia. It comes from pre-op. It comes from um, the OR director and supervisor. It comes from our surgeons. And we work as a team. All right. You mentioned the patient assessment done by your prep nurse being used by the nursing unit as admission assessment your illustration of redundant work. How can that be regarded as current assessment, and what window of time is this interval? 
because they might be talking about the discharge planning assessment being done before admission? Uh, no, I think they're talking about the preoperative assessment. So our um, preoperative assessment is performed within the 30-day surgical window. Uh, we bring our patients to our preoperative testing um, where they um, have their testing done within the 30 days required for anesthesia. Um, and the nurses in uh, pre-op perform um, the admission assessment. Um, this is then pulled over um, into the hospital chart, and then um, the pre-op nurses verify that the information has not changed, that the information is the same, or can make changes where pertinent. Uh, but, for example, history is history, and it does not change over time. So we're able to pull that over into the, the same day as surgery nursing assessment. Our next question asks, do you use loaner instrumentation? Loaner instrumentation? Um, Oh, well, I guess technically we can, uh, or we do. Um, our um, um, vending companies house their instruments here, I guess is the way I would, would call it. Um, they never leave our facility. Um, and so in some ways, I guess you would call them loaner instruments, uh, but they are housed here and haven't left here. So. Um, I guess that's a question of, of whether they're purchased or not. And the answer is ours are not purchased, uh, but they stay here permanently. What kind of advanced training has your orthopedic nursing staff received? Really? That's also something that's come up here. Is, uh, you're talking about specialty certification for orthopedic nursing is something that I've been pushing for a long time. Uh, we have a unique, maybe not so unique, but to me fairly unique um, um, nursing climate where our uh, registered nurses are, uh, are represented by a union. Um, and so what I find difficult is um, if we support uh, specialty certification or um, we, can't, we can't pay for it, um, so therefore, nurses don't feel that they can pay for it, um, and we cannot um, do something for one group of nurses that we aren't doing hospital-wide. Um, so um, our union representation kind of makes that an interesting climate. I've always encouraged nurses to go to get their certification, um, but I don't get very far with that. Now, in saying all of that, I, I think that all our orthopedic nurses would probably pass their certification very easily uh, because they have been on our orthopedic floor for years. We have very low turnover, and our nurses stay with us on our orthopedic floor for years. Uh, Sandy, you juggle both being a service line manager as well as clinical responsibilities. Uh, any tips to manage both these roles, and do you think it's important that you stay in the clinical realm? Well, I was gonna, I'm, I'm going to joke and say that's why I'm bald and that's why there is, I'm not on a webcam. Um, <laughs> it's very difficult. It, it, it's extremely difficult to balance both. Um, I think that, and my, I guess my complaint would be that I can be overutilized um, in the operating room or for clinical duties. Um, certainly, depending on what I have on my plate, uh, management-wise, um, is is it valuable? Um, absolutely. Um, to understand what happens on a day-to-day -day basis on the floor or in the OR, absolutely, that's valuable. I would have to say that after 30 years, I think I've kind of cut my teeth on that, and I have a good handle and understanding on what goes on, um, but. Even if I'm not assigned a room and, and scrubbing in the OR, I am on the floors and I am in the OR every day um, making brief rounds to check and make sure everything's OK. The next question asks, what are you doing to market your program or your service line? 
Um, marketing. Um, I've done some uh, um, studies or some surveys. We did a survey way back when I first started here about um, marketing, um, how do patients get to us. And what we found that in this um, survey that we gave to our patients in pre-op was 50% were coming because they were referred by their PCP. Uh, Fifty percent came by word of mouth. Um, we advertise um, in newspapers, billboards, um, radio, um, television commercials. Um, so we do all of those things. Okay. All right. We look like we have time for about one more question. How you mentioned that one of your first obstacles was getting the four surgeons who are treating patients four different ways. How do you navigate standardizing physician care paths when often they're resistant to changing the way they treat <laughs> standardization? Uh, I, I, I describe that as one of the most painful early evenings of my life. Um, we sat them down with our order sets and we walked out of that meeting about two or three hours, I'd say three hours later, with one order set. Um, it was painful. It was beneficial across the board. And um, um, it was better for the nurses. It was better for the patients. And overall, uh, better for the surgeons because they received more efficient care for their patients. Um, so, but that was a pretty painful evening. <laughs> it can be done. It can be done. All right, good to know. All right, that's the time we have for today. If you have questions that you didn't have a chance to ask, feel free to email them to info at wellv.me, and we'll get back to you. Everyone, watch your email tomorrow for a link to the recorded presentation and PDF slide set. Be sure to check out orthoserviceline.com for our next webinar in December. We'll be talking about the future of the muscular skeletal service line, what's new in 2013 and beyond. Um, so you can sign up for that. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day.